All right, folks. Well, uh, thank you for joining us this afternoon. And um, I'm going to do a little brief introduction. Our normal Coyle Fisher protocol is that we uh, do a brief introduction. We have our guest. And afterwards, then we have some dialogue and some Q&A. So I'm hoping you're going to be able to stay and enjoy that experience through the afternoon. So I did write this out. I know some of you know I don't usually write things out. But I had a few things I wanted to say. So. So I have to say it's a, really a pleasure. This is something I've been wanting to do for a long time, was to have Dr. Kathleen Ives, the CEO of the Online Learning Consortium, join us for a Coyle Fisher talk. So I have to tell you a little back, real quick backstory. But uh, Kathleen and I, at uh, 6 AM this morning, uh, did a back-to-back uh, -back presentations for a conference that was happening in um, Al-Najah, uh, Palestine. And um, we. It was supposed to be 6 a.m., but I think we might have got our clocks out of sync. It turned out to be more like 7 a.m. But Kathleen, when we when we queued that up, she says, why don't I just come down to Penn State? We'll do it out of Penn State. And I said, oh, if you're going to be here, let's turn it into a Coil Fisher, a Fisher talk. So, so Kathleen's been the director since 2013 at OLC. Some of you know OLC previously as the Sloan Sea Foundation. And before that, she worked with AT&T, CBS, and a number of educational uh, positions. One of the things I find really unique about Kathleen is that she's experienced online learning from multiple perspectives. Um, she, she has a degree from an online institution. Uh, she serves as a faculty at an online institution. And now she's been a leader in the field for uh, a number of years in a variety of different capacities. So I think she really brings a nice richness uh, by, by way of background. One of the advantages of being a CEO in an organization like OLC is you get this very broad lens and opportunity to see schools and, um, and in essence sort of benchmark. And so with the interest at Penn State in transforming education, uh, we uh, reached out and asked uh, Kathleen would she share with us some of those observations, some of what she's seeing uh, across the country and um, share with us and maybe a, a, for Penn State to do some reflection on how we're doing as well. Another connection point with Kathleen is uh, the Institute for Emerging Leadership and Online Learning. A lot of folks in the room from that group. And uh, I have to tell you, Kathleen was in the best <clears throat> inaugural, inaugural class of uh, uh, 2009 with the Institute as a participant. Uh, went on to become faculty member. In the last several years, as she's moved into a leadership role in OLC, she's become an advisor to IELOL. But Kathleen has never missed uh, our program. And I asked her about coming back this summer for IELOL. Would, would she be there? And she said, yeah, why? how would I miss that? So uh, some of you know that'll be our last year for Penn State and OLC. It has been an absolutely uh, pleasure and marvelous relationship with OLC, with Kathleen, with all of the leadership there. And uh, many of you have participated in that program, so I appreciate that as well. So with that, Kathleen, let me turn it over to you. Thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you. Even though six sounds early, it's not as early as, as one. So I have a poll up here. And I know some of you, those type A people, have already started to respond. So I'd love to see a few more responses. You're going to be answering the question, how has online learning impacted post-secondary education? And we're getting some interesting answers. Not unexpected. Learners, available, strategies, discussions, adult, which is now the number one uh, learner in the US, not the uh, 18 to 21 year old anymore. Um, so let's get started. Um, as Larry told you, I'm with the Online Learning Consortium, formerly the Sloan Consortium. Um, we're a professional organization dedicated to best practices in online education. And we do this in a couple of ways, through our conferences, through our research, through our professional development. Um, which includes, as Larry mentioned, the Institute for Emerging Leaders in Online Learning. Um, and it's been such a pleasure. I've been with the organization since 2005. Um, I was working at Quinn Sigamon Community College in Massachusetts at the time and came on as a consultant to start up their professional development. 
And just in that short period of time, it's been so amazing to see how this industry has totally evolved. So before you can go forward, I think you need to look back. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the history of online education, just to kind of put us all into context, because I think when you see where we've come from and, and you see where, where we potentially can be going, it's, it's pretty huge and pretty significant. I'll talk about some of the lessons learned. I'll talk about what some innovators are doing. And I'll talk about future models. And I feel very fortunate that you all have had me back here twice in, in a week or two weeks. Um, it's been great. Um, the first time I was here, I um, did some research on R1 institutions. And in preparation for today and for our upcoming conference in New Orleans next week, I've been talking with other um, institutions about innovations and where they're seeing this. So when I get to the future piece, I, I have grounded it in some research, but it's also based on conversations that I'm having out in the field. So when you think about online education, many, of our, the, many people that are not involved in the field don't realize, or online education, um, distance education, don't realize that it's not a recent development. It started with correspondence study in the 1800s. And I think, and I look at this slide and I think of three, um, three huge changes that happened in each of these periods. For correspondence, it was the, was the introduction of rural, rural, say that 10 times, rural free delivery because people in rural towns normally had to go pick up their mail. So when they started getting delivery to their locations, that's when correspondence study really, really blossomed. The second phase is when technology started making an impact. And, and I saw that, I see that happening in two forms. One was one to many. So you think about television, you think about radio, you think about satellites. So we started broadcasting education and supplemented that with that with course materials. But then you get two-way, so it's many-to-many, -many, right? So we can be engaging with our instructors. And that totally changed um, online education. What's interesting is in the early years is that institutions did not particularly care if, if the programs made a profit, um, which I find interesting because the International Correspondence uh, Institute, I believe it's now, um, the name of it is. But it, at that time, it was like in the early 1900s, they had over 900,000 students enrolled and they had a sales force of 1,200. Um, but for colleges and universities, this was very much a mission-driven thing. They wanted to grant access to those individuals. So money was not part of the equation at that juncture. And then comes the internet, which was truly a game changer. And it was a game changer for a couple of reasons. One is it provided three different forms of, of interactivity. Okay, so fueled by that 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 many to many, you had not only the interaction with the content, you had the interaction with the instructor, and you had interaction with other learners. Um, what what traditional colleges and universities didn't see in those early years was the potential, which is ironic because they did with correspondence, was the potential to reach those learners that could not get an education any other way. And so the for-profits came in, didn't have any legacy systems, and they were able to quickly ramp up and create a model that attracted those students, working mothers, people in the military, um, people that wanted to go to school part-time but couldn't go to a face-to-face -face class. Um, so that was a real opportunity that, you know, and I'll say we missed because I also came from a traditional institution as well. Um, However, although uh, the for-profits experienced amazing growth, and if you look at this slide, by 2010, nearly 3 million students were enrolled in online degrees. And look at this, 70% were attending for-profit universities. Um, but what happened was, when enrollment started to go down a bit, they focused on their marketing um, and their enrollment versus product development. And that's when you began to see you know, all the stuff coming out about their enrollment practices. Because they really weren't focusing on making a better product. They were focusing on getting more students. And again, they were for profits. They were looking at the bottom line. Um, so when you think about the organization that, was really, that really bothered our, our organization, um, 
many in individuals think that the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation was really one of the entities that helped legitimize online education. I think we all, for those of us in the field, we all still get some questions about, well, is it really quality? Is it really as effective? Um, it's starting to go away, but you, but you still, still hear it. Um, but what the Sloan Foundation did, and Larry gave me a great history um, a week or so ago when I was interviewing him, is they looked at some of the innovative universities that were doing things in distance education and they funded them. And guess what? Penn State was one of those universities. Um, and so they funded these, these different projects. And Larry, you, you told me the, the model. There was three categories, which I don't remember. On campus? Your campus. OK. So they looked at three different models. So they were looking at a whole way of looking at how they could um, access these, these learners. Um, the Sloan Foundation probably put in over $100 million, um, at that for a period of time in the 90s and they invested in over 356 projects. They, um, as a result of those early um, uh, grantees, as Larry you know, told me, they came to kind of together organically because they truly were pioneers in the field, right? So they came together to share best practices and to meet, and that became what was, is my organization, the Sloan Consortium. Um, also, the foundation funded something called the Annual Survey of Online Learning that comes out every year. It looks at the state of online learning in the US. And another place where the, uh, the Sloan Foundation, I thought, really made an impact, and some of you may remember this, was during Hurricane Katrina, when many of those um, New Orleans colleges and universities had to close. The foundation quickly pulled together its members and we were able to put over 700 individuals through school. They were not displaced, and they were able to go on and, and, and complete their degrees or finish their degrees. So what I'd like to do now is, is take a break. We were talking about different forms of, um, of engaging audiences, and I, I hate being the sage on the stage. But what, I, what I'd like you to do, we're, we're a small enough group, and I know we've got some individuals that are remotely, and I'm hoping that, that Brad will, will engage with them is I'd like you to, you to take just a minute or two and think about what you see as the top ways in which online learning has shifted the ways that faculty operate. So I'll let you just kind of mull about that for a minute. And then I'm, I'm going to ask you to kind of turn to the individual next to you and kind of see what you come up with. So think about the ways in which online learning has shifted the ways in which faculty operate, some of your thoughts. And then if you could just turn around to the person next to you or a couple people and just share what you think. And those of you that are remotely, you can type into Brad. And we'll do a, a bit of a debrief after a couple of minutes. I know some of you are processors. It takes you a little bit to kind of wrap your brain around it. And after you think about faculty, think about the institutional level as well. So you've got faculty and you've got the institution.
we're discussing. Good to see you. Okay, if you haven't moved on to discussing how it's impacted the institution, why don't you kind of shift gears and, and think about how online learning has impacted the institution. Okay, take one more minute and wrap it up. Just one more minute, kind of get your concluding thoughts out. All righty. All right, Larry, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put you to work. You're going to work off that lunch we just ate. <laughs> you're going to be the mic runner. OK. All right, so thoughts. First, let's talk about the faculty. And Brad, if you could be the voice of those that are remote. Great. We'll take you on the line. OK. So uh, we are all over the place. We have a, a very active discussion going on uh, <laughs> online. Uh, and I, I think it's uh, representative of the fact that we have a, a broad audience online from multiple institutions. Okay, cool. Uh, and so one of the, one of the things that started to, to rise out was uh, 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 the access and support and the, the way that we look at what a course is. Yes. Where in a traditional model, very often it was a, a lesson by lesson, a day by day perspective, and that has shifted to... Mm -hmm. Uh, over a course, over a semester, over years, and the supports that are necessary for that, which brings in additional teams. We're having a discussion right now about uh, learning design support uh, and yeah. the variability of that across institutions. That's huge. Uh, so very, uh, very uh, uh, diverse opinions and perspectives in here, but it seems like uh, one of the ways that has shifted the way faculty operate is the faculty being the, the center of the course and shifting that out to a team approach where there are multiple supports and an increased focus on engaging the students mm -hmm. that may come about naturally when we're all looking at one another but needs to be fostered and thought about in an online space. Right. I'll talk a, a little bit about my early days in the, in the online Yellow Pages, but 
I know from my experience as a faculty in the, in the early days, you still thought it was a, a solo journey and you would just translate everything that you were doing in your face-to-face -face class online. And it's really taken the, the instructional designers and that whole discipline to help us reimagine the online curriculum. So I appreciate that point of view. Larry. Do you want another one? I would Let's love another one. Another one? Ladies, can I ask one of you to provide some input? Apparently you have no choice. <laughs> <laughs> and then he runs and leaves you with the microphone. <laughs> um, one of the things that came up in our discussion is it also gives the faculty more flexibility. Mm -hmm. Do you want to elaborate on that? Or? Well, I think when faculty have the opportunity to um, teach students who live at a distance, uh, and they really recognize the additional value um, of the flexibility that online learning brings. Both for the um, faculty and for the students. For the faculty and the yeah. students. Uh, I'm always real cautious of that phrase, anytime, anywhere, mm. because faculty do tend to stick to a schedule. You still oh, have a schedule embedded yeah. in, in the course. Um, but I do think the faculty appreciate the flexibility that it brings them. So, um, we, oh, oh, Amanda, go to, go to Amanda. Do you want more? You're good? OK, thanks. I think one of the ways that it's impacted as well is bringing um, kind of a multicultural diversity to our classrooms for people who have um, you know, never, ever been able to engage before yeah. because they're in a rural area. You know, they might be active duty military. I mean, there's a lot of students that can now participate in our kind of active classroom learning that couldn't before because, um, you know, where they were located. But even so, um, they, they can really participate at their level. Depend, you know, it isn't any time, but um, being able to just participate, you know, in a discussion board at whatever time they could and have that connection still with their faculty member, which I think is crucial. Our yeah. president, by the way, has uh, several mandates out for Penn State. Yeah. And I think it's number one is access. So I, I love that idea of sort of broadening the lens. Yeah, you I probably have seen that too. Yeah, absolutely. Um, institutional impact. Do people talk about that? Chris has got a big smile on his face. So I know he's got something <laughs> around here. So. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. okay. Institutional. I don't want to get feedback there by getting him too close. I like that. So I came up with one big one, like it just jumped out of me. Go. Let's see if Jan has the same one I, I was thinking of. At the institutional level, we see new revenue streams. Mm -hmm. That's what and I thought. That's, yep. That's huge. Yep. It's bigly. Yeah. Over Let's here. Go over here to Jim. Okay, now we're going to go to Brad because we got him online too. We want to yeah. go. We're going after Jim. Well, in our in our program in the statistics department, the online uh, formal development of curriculum and learning goals has spilled over into the resident courses. So it really has improved our resident course uh, structure yeah. and and uh, uniformity across the curriculum. So it's been a big help. How, how many others have experienced that same thing? I would agree. It, the same, it was the same for me as well. It was amazing. Great. Let's hear from our online ones. Brad, what are they saying about institutional? Uh, two main points. One being uh, the additional uh, need for delivering student supports uh, mm -hmm. above and beyond what, what was uh, typical. And then also institutionally, less reliance on full-time on-campus faculty. It's uh, positive in that it brings in experts from across the globe negative in that there's less departmental cohesion and stratification mm -hmm. of roles. Okay, that's great. One over here, Renee. in the back. I think it's increased a sense of urgency in the sense that we want to get to the starting gate first. We want to make sure we're competitive. We're not mm -hmm. losing students, all of those kinds of things. And yes. it's, it's at, I think, all levels, not, not just institution-wide, but individuals are feeling that and individual programs as well. You know what that just triggered for me as, as a faculty member, which never happened to me as an on-ground faculty when you talk about sense of urgency. I have students emailing me like two weeks before the course starts asking me when I'm going to be opening it up. I mean, in a face-to-face -face class, maybe I'd get a call or two about, could you send me the syllabus? But I think it's also perpetuating to the students as well. Yeah. Uh, the competition. So the competition in a global sense, but also the competition of needing to up our game 
of what a good outcome of competition is, we've got to get better. We're no longer protected by geography, yeah. right? And we can draw a certain degree. It's now global. So the school down the road that never competed with Penn State before because of size and, and such, now all of a sudden in that virtual space is a competitor to a degree around certain programs. So yeah. I think that's a great input. Yep. Let's go to Shuba. Tied to the comments about curriculum and meeting students where they are, and revenue, one of the other... <laughs> oh, Drew, okay. Drew's got one. Let me go up to here to Shuba. Let me get you a working mic. Uh, that the... intention. Okay, yeah, right, okay. <laughs> With uh, related to curriculum shifts and how we're seeing, um, we're traditionally a research-oriented uh, institution focused on MA, MS, PhD, and now we're talking about more professional degrees mm -hmm. and outcomes for our students that are professionals and how they can apply things to the workplace in an immediate uh, environment rather than sort of when they grow up. They're, they yeah. they want immediate application, and that's sort of shifting the types of degrees we offer as well. Yep. Perfect. Thank you, Drew. Now? Okay. Yes. <laughs> Hi. Uh, it's it's more on the on the negative side of you know we, we like new revenue streams those are wonderful mm -hmm. but on the negative side of that I, I think there's a heightened awareness and, and philosophy of the student as a customer and I and I hear the language of student as customers and, and we're developing new ways to um, to market education to them and I think the online um, arena has played a pivotal role. And, and how, how the culture of a student as, as a customer. And I don't think that that's all a very positive thing mm -hmm. because it runs right up against the learning outcomes that we want to see yeah. happen. Um, and I don't, I don't think that's a very positive. There's a downward sort of pressure on, on, on the enterprise of higher education um, that, that really makes purchases on the neoliberal ideologies that, yeah. that I don't think are very constructive. That's a good point. All right. Okay. So moving on, and the survey said, so I, we talked to people out in the field to say, what, what's happened? What's been the implications of online learning? And, and as you all have said, it, it's, it's impacted the people, the organization, the process, and technology, and from both a faculty and student perspective. Um, so we've had to come up with different teaching strategies. Our learners have had to come up with different learning strategies. How many of you have had learners who are blown away about how much work and online courses. They're just not, yeah, they just don't realize how much reading and engaging they're going to do. Like in this room, although we, we forced you to have a little bit of dialogue, you can kind of sit in the back and, you know, and can be invisible if you choose. But you really, I feel like in the, in the online cl classroom, it's almost like the emperor has no clothes because you as faculty can see what your students are doing. Um, the whole notion of scheduling and how do you support faculty and students it has been huge. And then the whole notion of professional development. In the early days, we thought, as I said earlier, we could just put our course online and it would be fine. But there is a different way. There is a different pedagogy to begin teaching online that's, that's different from the face-to-face -face classroom. And I think in the early days, we just, we just didn't get it. We just didn't figure it out. Um, evaluation and assessment. How do we assess? And what if, oh, God forbid, someone cheats because they can. I don't see them. Um, compensation. Um, and again, I think I put professional development twice, but professional development I think is, is really key. Um, some of the things that when we were talking to people, people said affect the student outcomes is student persistence. So there's a certain type of student that really will thrive in an online environment. And that's a student that has to persist and not be daunted if the system goes down or if it's the wrong version of the syllabus, that they can keep coming back and, and they're engaged. Um, the other things they're saying is that, that learning activities coupled with assessment improve uh, student outcomes, as well as timely and actionable feedback. The other point um, people made is that the faculty has to be engaged in all aspects of the student's journey in the class. If the faculty steps away from the picture, it really creates a difference. I remember in one of my doctoral classes, my faculty member didn't show up for three weeks. Um, and so it was all of us trying to you know, facilitate our own learning, but the faculty member really does make a difference. Um, 
And then periodic course assessment. Again, I go back to the emperor has no clothes. It's right out there. You can see the course, and you want to take a look at it and see what's working and what's not. And I don't know about, about um, all of you, but I teach several courses repeatedly. And I would have to say there hasn't been one time that I haven't gone back in and changed the course a bit. Not a major rehaul, but just every time I teach it, I learn something new or the students react in a different way. So I have to go back and constantly make sure that it's, it's fresh and it's different. Um, the other things that affect student learning outcomes is if you have a problem-based learning component so that they can engage both singularly and collaboratively, collaboratively as well as a project-based component. Threaded discussions and even self-reflected, and it could be as simple as, you know, what, what worked for you this week or what, what, what information didn't you, didn't you get that you were hoping to secure in, the, in this course. Um, I think I know I found out, um, because I work primarily with adult learners, that not all adult learners, at least the group that I've been teaching, are very proficient techno technologically. And so ensuring that you have a, an assessment to make sure that the online modality is right for that student, whether it's, a tech, whether it's technology, whether it's workload management. Um, that's what Phoenix found out, um, that they had, you know, when they were doing all their enrollment practices, that they weren't ensuring that the students that were coming in could really thrive in that environment. So if you notice right after the, the, the brouhaha, and it really was getting heated about these enrollment practices, they actually on their website, right on their front page, had an assessment there about is online learning right for you? Because as we all know, it's not, it's not perfect for everyone. Um, and then you think about faculty outcomes. And this one has been huge. Um, and, and you still see it today in many of our institutions, faculty acceptance. And, and we talked about it a little bit earlier. Is online instruction as good as face-to-face? -face? And I would offer up that, and it was said earlier, which I thought was great, that online teaching is a misnomer, that we've come to know that we're not teaching online. We've changed our role. We've become the guide. I hate this phrase, but it's so apropos, the guide on the site. Um, so you're really not a teacher anymore. Um, the knowledge and skills and comfort with technology, let's, let's face it, many of our students are much younger than us. They're digital natives, and they can whip through the technology, and we're not as proficient. So that, that can be um, a barrier infecting uh, people or faculty being comfortable with, with online learning. Um, we spoke a little bit about copyright and intellectual property. It's been a big challenge, particularly in the early years, for faculty to understand what they can take from the web and put in their online courses and what they can't. Um, and then the one that we hear over and over again is workload. Just as for the students, for the faculty, it is a lot of work to design and create and to teach an online course. And a lot of faculty have not been prepared for that. Um, couple more things, and you're probably saying, why is she saying all this? We know it. But I, as you start to think about the changes that are impacting our environment and the changes that we've gone through, I think it's important for us to kind of ground ourselves in the journey that we've taken and the journey that we're about to, to, to go on. So again, managing student expectations. You've got these digital natives. They're ready. They want to hear from you 24-7. How many of you have had an email from a student on Christmas Day saying, what's my grade? How did I do? Um, you know, the, the boundaries are down. Um, the whole notion of communication, I think you can't communicate enough because, believe it or not, in an online course, students don't necessarily read everything. So you have to make sure that you're communicating the message in many different ways, whether it's through a video, whether it's through different places in the learning management system. The devil's in the detail. Again, unlike in a face-to-face -face class where you can almost instantaneously ask a question, you want to make sure that you are very clear with your instructions with your students. Personalization. You know, people, there's been a lot of research done on social presence. And how can you make sure that that experience is not isolating? I've heard faculty tell me they do things um, like have um, students post bios and photos or maybe even short videos. And I know one faculty member who even takes copious notes um, of these you know, short bios. And when she's engaging with a student, She'll go back to her notes and say, oh, so how's your son doing? Did he recover from tonsillitis? But it's how can you make that not feel so cold, that, that online environment. Um, we spoke about cheating and ethics. And again, keeping, keeping the course up to date um, is truly important. 
So there's been a lot of for-profit bashing. And as Larry said in, in, in my introduction, I did graduate. I received my doctorate from, from a for-profit. And I have taught at several for-profits as well as several non-for-profits. And I, I, at the risk of being in the minority, I think we all can learn a ton for for-profits. And, and I'll tell you some of the things that I think are really important. First of all, we talked about how the for-profits got into online education. They looked at that population that wasn't being served. Um, also, for-profits, um, and I know we, we talked about students as a customers, and it's, it's good news, bad news, but they're very goal-oriented. They're very focused on metrics. That's how they, they run, their, run the organization. Because they don't have legacy systems or legacy processes and procedures, they're able to make changes a lot more quickly. Um, and again, they focus on metrics driving profits, and the staff is all engaged in that as well. So it doesn't just come from the administration. Faculty, everyone knows what, what the bottom line should be. Typically, particularly in the, the early years, you saw a lot of these for-profits bring in individuals with a corporate background. That's not such a bad thing. I know we don't want to say that we're running a business, but we really kind of are. Um, and we want to make sure that our institution is, is self-sustaining. So having someone that understands business models and can be out there, I think, is, is really key. The automation that they've been able to integrate, again, not having legacy systems, it's been, it's been easier for them than for some of our, our institutions that have you know, started out years ago. They also typically have a smaller workforce. So many of them use primarily adjunct faculty, totally different model there. Um, they were analytics driven before we, and I say we focusing on being in the, in the not-for-profit, were, were analytics driven. Um, and, I, and I'll tell you, I'll tell you my story. So I, I got my degree in 2001 and I started teaching for a for-profit in 2004. They were watching me even at, at that juncture about how often I was in the cla online classroom, how often and how quickly I would respond to a student. And I would get a note immediately if I had not met their requirements. But this was all automated. It wasn't an individual watching me. They had already developed that type of automation to make sure that the faculty members were really engaged with the students. The professional development, I have to say, I have never received this type of, a, of professional development at a not-for-profit institution. And I'll just go through one of my experiences. I had to interview for, for the job, but I had to interview in a scenario-based um, type of exercise. So there were five of us. They put us through several different scenarios. They, had us, um, they asked us to, to show how we would teach. Uh, we then went through an online training program where we had to pass the rigors of that. We then, after we um, finished the online training program, we had to put in a request for a course, and we had to match that that request with all of our professional experience as well as our academic experience. Then we taught our first course and we had someone that was a mentor that was in the course that was following us all the way through and giving us feedback through, through that course. Every one of those hurdles you could, op, you could be kicked out. Um, after that, again, as I, as I mentioned earlier, you were tracked all the way through your programs and you would never know. You could be in the fifth week of your course and all of a sudden someone would show up and they would be monitoring you and how you were engaging with your students. OK, we've got another poll for you here. Just take a break from me talking. So the poll is, what are the ways that those in the field of online learning learn from other industries? Do I have to do something, Brad? Thank you. Brad's going to activate it because it wasn't. Thank you. All right. So what are those what are the ways that those in the field of online learning learn from other industries? So you can just text your responses. Okay, research, distributed employees, virtual teams. Standards, great. 
Twitter. Just in time, formal, informal. Management, good. Support, students and employees. So I'm gonna I'm gonna tell you my story. Um, so I, I didn't start in academia, as as Larry mentioned. I started back in the day of of many new technologies. How many of you have ever heard of teletext? Wow. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so teletext was a precursor to the World Wide Web. It was launched late 70s, early 80s. Um, the ExtraVision slide up here is an example of a teletext screen. Look at the fabulously intricate graphics. The way you received this information was through the vertical blanking interval on your television screen. I was part of the first trial with CBS, PBS, and NBC. And we were so frigging excited that we could put up the news and everything. I remember my first day on the job when the graphic designer put a dog up there and his tail was flashing. That was really cool in the early 80s, I have to say. Um, so that was kind of a precursor to online. But online didn't happen then. So then you moved into something called video text. I have an example up here. And I went with CBS to New York, where I worked on the service that became Prodigy. Now, Prodigy in the early days had separate terminals that were given out to individuals. And again, you were getting news information, and Prodigy even enabled you to shop. So that, that was pretty big, too. Then I went to um, uh, 9X, which is, uh, was, is Verizon at the time, and we started taking a look at yellow pages. I know for some of you that's a big yawn, but electronic yellow pages, again, was pretty cool back in the day. Because a lot of individuals, think about it if you're visually impaired, had never had a way that they could get directory information. And the phone companies were pretty cutting edge. And 9X, 9X was one of them. Um, we, were, we were encumbered by all kinds of restrictions. But we were out there. We started putting our listings um, electronically. We partnered with Prodigy. We partnered with, with AOL. We then moved into um, the Jacob K. Javits Convention Center in New York and the Heinz Convention Center in Boston. We had freestanding kiosks, um, and, and we were pretty much at the forefront. Again, the World Wide Web hadn't happened, but the World Wide Web did happen. And something happened to my company at the time, Verizon, the Yellow Pages company. So if you think about it, look at the, look at the book that I grew up with over here, and look at the book that currently exists in many, many parts of the country. Notice how thin it got. What happened was, and these are some of the lessons that I learned, which is things, these are things that keep me up at night when I think about online education, traditional systems, legacy systems. We were housed. Um, the product that we finally developed was called Big Yellow. It's now called Super Pages. We were housed in a small entrepreneurial area of the organization. We were isolated from the core business. We had no engagement with the salespeople and for, for, for a variety of reasons. This is just the way it was. Um, so we were doing everything on our own. We were not tied at all to each other. Um, so we never could really leverage the core business. We even had to license the listings. Again, I, you know, these were all situations, the hand that we were dealt, not all of them could, could be predicted. But if you look at what happened to the Yellow Pages, they had the perfect opportunity. They were there before the web to be the search engine, the directory of choice. And we even, in our visioning, envisioned that. But if you ask my daughter, who's 30 years old, does she ever use the Yellow Pages, the answer pretty much is no. And what you found is that these other disruptors came in. I mean, Google, now you can get restaurants. You can do all the searches that the Yellow Pages promised. And if you go to the next slide, the Yellow Pages was a pretty profitable business. Back in the 80s, 50% of the US population looked at a Yellow Pages product twice a week. The rest of us looked at it maybe once or maybe, maybe one and a half times a week. They had a great business model. The Yellow Pages advertising was attached to your phone bill. So it was billed on your phone bill. So you didn't want your phone to be turned off, did you? No, so you would always pay that bill. So the money was coming in. It was a, a, an incredible cash cow. 
but technology, they weren't prepared. Um, and even though they were positioned in the right place at the right time, the new entrants came in, they became the disruptors. And now, as you can see from this chart, who really does look at the yellow pages anymore? So getting back to the state of online education today, it's getting, it's getting better and better. Um, there's a 3.9 increase in numbers of distance education students. More than one in four students are taking an online course. Um, public institutions command the largest portion of distance ed students. And, and for all of us, online education is, is here to stay. We partner with an organization called the New Media Consortium. Um, we received a, a grant from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation a couple of years ago to help um, look at the impact digital courseware can make on students. And NMC is also a grantee. They do a lot of work in analyzing technological trends. And I thought these slides were, were interesting. And again, this, these are context slides. But basically what they've done, this, these are key trends that they've seen. And they started the, looking at from 2012 from 2017. So you can see some of these on here, students as creators, the ubiquity of social media. And it, you can also see some of them start and then stop and start and then stop. As they say in their report, they're doing kind of a broad brush of when, when these topics are real, people are really engaged in these topics and then when they kind of go away and then when we kind of re-engage with them again. The next chart I'm going to show you is also from NMC. This looks at the challenges that we face as educators and, and there are many. Um, looking how we blend formal and informal learning, keeping education relevant, metrics, rethinking the role of edu educators. We've talked about equity. So these are, again, all the challenges that technology has brought forth. So we've got the trends and, and, the, and the challenges. Now, again, just kind of think back to the beginning of this conversation. Look where we've come and look what we're dealing with as faculty and institutions. This isn't insignificant. And then the final one is the developments in technology, which if you talk to a lot of faculty members can be overwhelming. How do we, as faculty, how, is, how do we as institutions stay on top of it? How do we pick the right technology? Um, Larry was talking to me today that, um, about some of the stuff that you're doing in digital ed. And how do, you, how do you decide what's the technology that you're going to invest in? What are the metrics that you're using for evaluation? Is it where the jobs are? Is it because you think it has the best penetration? Um, is it because of its capabilities? And then just to make your brain explode, I just added a few more. So I mean, again, some of these things you know, we hadn't even heard of a year ago, let alone 10 years ago. Um, so all of this technology is, is shaping not only our, our academic environments, but our workplace. And we need to ensure that our students are employable. And, and you know that we hear about that a lot right now. How are we training today's workforce? And so these are all things that, as educators, we need to keep in mind. So at NMC, when they analyze their trends, they talk about what they see as long-term, mid-term, and short-term impacts. And so what they're seeing in five to seven years, a long-term impact, is advancing the culture of innovation. How can we create that environment in our institutions where we encourage and reward entrepreneurial behavior? Again, we've been talking about that over the day and a half that, I, that I've been here. Um, do we put incentives for our faculty and our administrators? Do we encourage them to fail? Because not all innovations are successful. So how can we create a culture of innovation? Also, the whole notion of deeper learning. How can our students really master content that is is going to engage them and, and make them employable. So what are some of the deep dives that we need to do in our, in our curriculum? Um, there's a growing focus on measuring learning, you know, analytics, and how are, we how are we ensuring that our students are meeting their learning objectives and the learning outcomes that we state for them? How can we course correct? How can we guarantee that they'll be successful? And also, how can we redesign learning spaces that are meaningful? Is this a meaningful learning space for all of us to get together where we're lined up in rows? Are there ways that we can be more creative as far as creating environments where students can learn and apply what they're learning? And then short-term trends that they're seeing which is in the immediate future is just the growing sophistication of blended learning designs. 
you're seeing that you know even in the K through 12 markets, that's a, a growing model, and how can we begin, begin to capitalize on it and leverage it, as well as collaborative learning. Just like the instructor's journey is no longer a solo journey, the learner's journey shouldn't be a solo journey. We don't, we don't tend to work solo in our, in our day jobs, um, so how can we get them to collaborate and create new knowledge? All of these trends and all of these challenges can bring both opportunities and threats. So if you begin to think about education and you begin to think about its purpose, what's its purpose today for our students and what might its purpose be tomorrow? Is it to get a degree? Is it to refine some skills? Um, so purpose is going to be changing and I think we need to be prepared for that. Someone else I think early on talked about equity. How is technology going to be developed and provide to our students equitably? Well, we still have an information-rich gap and an information-poor, because technology is going to be so critical to, to learning. Um, I think you're also going to see a greater learner responsibility, because again, going back to, to the student as customer, they have so many options to choose from. So they're going to have to take more accountability for their own learning. How do they want to learn? Where do they want to learn? What do they want to learn? And then if you think about how fast technology changes, think about the governance structures in our institution, which don't change that fast. How can we create an environment within our institution that encourages us to make decisions rapidly, because as rapidly as technology is changing? We're also going to have to ensure that we have these catalytic roles in the institution. Because let's, let's face it, right now we, ha we had the for-profits who came in as competitors, but there could be other unforeseen competitors that come into the marketplace and, and go after our students. Think about McDonald's U. Um, again, small example, but there may be others out there that we haven't even thought about, new organizational models. So how can we be more responsive? We also have to think about the role of the educator. We talked about the educator as a facilitator, but as technology comes in and sh helps us shape our classes, what is the role of this educator going to be? Will the educator be team facilitating with, with, uh, with an artificial um, a piece of intelligence or a bot? Will the educator be a student custodian? What will the role of the educator be in this new technological environment? And then finally, the use of technology. Because we have so many options, we have to decide where does the human experience end and the technological experience begin. So how much responsibility do we want to give to technology in the classrooms? And these will be all the decisions that we're going to have to be making. So I talked a little bit about competitors. Here are just a few that are mirroring entrepreneurial know-how. Uh, the CAPS Network and um, Minerva are very focused on giving a combination of professional experience, experiential learning. Um, the CAPS Network has actually helped um, students start their own businesses. Um, if you look at the UnCollege, the UnCollege is all about students taking a gap year. So they encourage them to do that, and then they come back and they help them acquire skills. Again, all of these efforts are technology enabled. The um, field fellowship, um, what they do is they encourage students not to go on to college, and they give them money to start their own business. And they let them use this money for two years. Um, so again, there are different kinds of educational models that are being trialed. Not all of them will be successful, but how can we be at the forefront of some of these new educational models? So that leads me to a discussion that Larry and I had this morning when we were, we were speaking with our colleagues in, in Palestine. And it's the design of a smart educational environment. And I have to say, in the time that I've known all of you at Penn State, I think you, you by far are well on your way with some of the initiatives I've heard that you're doing. But a smart educational environment really provides smart learning and self-motivation by the student, for the student. And it's very personalized, and it happens anytime, anywhere. So don't think of the classroom anymore. This, it can happen when a student's at a baseball game. It can happen when a student's just walking down the street. So this type of learning is very, very tied into the environment. 
and it's enriched with technology. So this can be, you know, adaptive devices, wearables, any of those things. So if we take this scenario even further, what a smart learning oncology has is a real world context and real world scenarios and it will adapt the tasks for the individual learner. So think if you're a, um, uh, a physics teacher and you're, you're studying velocity with your students. Instead of sitting in a classroom, what if you went to the racetrack and, and did something with automobiles and cars and wearables? Um, the, the smart learning environment will offer personalized feedback to the learner. Also will coach the learner, again, like faculty do from the side. Uh, we'll make tools and strategy recommendations depending on, on the task at hand. And we'll be able to understand whether the student is online or in the real world. And so let's, let's think of an example. And when I was talking to Larry today, I, I was using this example of, of a telescope. So a student walks into a science class, and he or she has a tablet. And she walks up to a telescope. And the telescope senses that, that that she or he is there and sends a signal to the tablet. And if the student wants to engage with the telescope, the student will indicate to the tablet, yes, I want to engage with the telescope. The telescope then begins collecting information from the tablet about that student, maybe how old he or she is, where they are in the science program, um, where they've done well in, in, in assessments, where they've not, not done well, what their interests are. Okay. And then the telescope may show the student on the tablet what the telescope is currently looking at. And then the telescope, again, may bring in other learners from around the globe who are focusing on the same type of learning experience as that particular student. And maybe, maybe we want to throw an assessment or a game. So they may put in a gaming type of situation there for that student. So you can begin to see the types of potential that this can have. And this is all through wearable, mobile, um, tablet types of devices. It, it is kind of can, can, like I said earlier, make your, make your head explode. And again, all the way through, the student is being coached and being guided. So I would say that right now, with regards to smart learning, it's almost like where we were with the web, like web 1.0 and web 2.0. I think we're at 1.0. And there's some really interesting examples of what people are doing. And I know you're doing some of these things here. But these are some that, that I, I pulled out for you. There's a, um, this is called the Unmanned Vehicle University. And they're teaching students via drones and technology how to operate drones, OK? So they're getting real-time, real-world experience. There's a university in England, University of Limerick. They wanted to work on collaboration, but spe specifically types of analyses that their students could run through. So these are businesses' analyses. And they did this with, with in, in multiple environments, in a tax environment and an accounting environment but very interactive, engaging. They can run scenarios very much like a simulation, see what happens, run the scenario again. Duke University, um, they used uh, robots to help diagnose um, diseases and tra are training their students how to use robotic technology. And finally, my, my last example is what they're doing at um, Australia's National Aquarium. They've enabled their divers to go down and use video conferencing in new and interesting ways so they can communicate with students all over the world and have them really experience what's going on down under the, the Great Barrier Reef. So I'm, I'm going to conclude to begin to think about what, what's education going to look like for us in the future. I think it's going to be unbundled. I think we're going to become more service oriented as much as we don't like to say students as customers because they'll have more opportunities and more ways that they're going to want to learn based on the requirements of the job or their own, own personal inclination. And so I think we have to think about the potential of these smart learning environments, even though I think they're, they're years off, about what we can begin to do to work with our students. Um, and prepare them more, more effectively using technology. And so my, my final question, just for you to think about and ponder is, 
What is your vision for the future of education? So thank you. <laughs> Process at Penn State of of uh, vi visiting this question. What 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 is the transformation of education look like at Penn State, uh, and what might be our vision? Uh, Renata is one of our uh, leaders in that in that effort, and I'm wondering, Renata, if you have from your work so far. I know you've got a lot of data. Uh, are you seeing, or is there anything emerging in your mind about what uh, vision at Penn State? Yeah, so, well, we've been meeting with a lot of people, and I'm looking around the room and seeing a lot of familiar faces having been in some of our sessions before. Um, I think there are a couple of things we're seeing. One is, um, first of all, where, where we see something emerging, we also see something else that we're seeing the counterpoint to it. And, and Kathleen, you mentioned some of this. I'll give you a couple of them. Uh, we're seeing the idea of personalization or individualization, and we do struggle a bit with those two terms, but more of an, an individual engagement, but the necessity to still have students be parts of community. So we see these two sides, the individual and the community part. Uh, we are seeing things about what we want to transform largely, but what has to endure at an institution like ours. And those second decisions about what endures are as important as what is transformed. Um, even today, we were talking about, we had our task force, uh, our group today, where we were meeting, and we were debriefing having been with students, parts of us with students, with FOs. I'm trying to remember, Karen, which all we were with. We were faculty and staff, uh, staff that were involved in enrollment management, so we're a wide variety of folks. Uh, and we were all reporting out, and we're seeing a lot of these things. The necessity to maintain, at an institution like ours, the um, general and broad knowledge, as well as the necessity to still keep specialized. Being able to be deeply knowledgeable in some ways, but able to very quickly access information. Yeah. So these, these skill sets that we have to uh, make sure our students have are really sometimes at odds, or the ways we approach things are at odds. So I think it's a matter of trying to get the right balance here. I do not think this is about a pendulum swinging far to one side or the other, but it's really about finding where is that new place that fits with all of the, the technologies. Um, I will also say that I think there's a lot of ideas that we are finding as an institution that we are commonly, or it's just like, I shouldn't say commonly, we are getting around in, a, in common agreement. And that's really very nice for this institution because we're not seeing a lot of things are, that are at odds. They will challenge us still, but they are not at odds. And so uh, I think we're, we're, we're having some really good discussion. And if you haven't been part of these discussions yet, I'm sure we still have a few more of our sessions somewhere sometime. But, uh, so Kathleen, I'm curious, which in, in the work that you're doing across the country, are you seeing institutions kind of engage in this dialogue and call it visioning or revisioning, but you know, doing this reflection about what's it going to look like, or are institutions still kind of looking back and figuring out how they're going to survive in a I, new I space? I think, unfortunately, I think it's more, more the latter. It really has to be driven from the top. It has to be part of the mission and, mission and vision, and as I talked about before, it has to be part of the culture. So there's so many things that need to align. You know, what you'll see is you'll see pockets of really innovative individuals, whether it's in, in, in the administration or in the faculty that, that get it, but not often do you see a, a, an institution that's, that's truly aligned. I mean, I, I just really respect a lot of the work that I've been watching you all do because I know it's hard work, um, but it's, it's, it's really necessary. I think the great thing at Penn State is we all agree with everyone. That's just the you know, philosophy, I, I've right? I've noticed that. We're not, yeah, 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 just, yeah. Oh, yes, ma'am. So. Craig, mm -hmm. uh, or Brad, let me go to you real quick. Any, any questions, comments? So uh, other thoughts here for, uh, for Kathleen. Karen? So uh, one kind of challenge, I mean, the, the one note on your slide that online teaching is not teaching anymore. I, you know, I'm not sure I agree with that. I mean, I would say that there's many models for teaching and imparting knowledge, building knowledge, sharing knowledge. Mm -hmm. 
and um, I think it's challenged some of the traditional roles. Yep. You know, but we still have courses that video capture, live video capture, that our lecture. Mm -hmm. We have courses still where it's a lot of the narrative and the voice of the faculty. Yeah. You know, we do definitely have a more of a facilitation role of faculty. Mm -hmm. um, but I would say all of those things could be an element of teaching. I mean, I think there's different models. Um, but I'd hate to see the role of the online instructor minimized to say it's not mm -hmm. teaching, it's just facilitating. Good point. Yeah. Good, thank you. So I've got one about, uh, so an observation, yeah. if you would, Kathleen, about we're, we're a big research institution, 24, mm -hmm. 25 campuses. I forget how many we, we count uh, on a given date. I'm, you know, I was thinking, I was struck by the screen where you had up Minerva and those different mm -hmm. kind of the uncollege, I think yeah. it was. Is there any thought from your, from your perspective of, is that a space where a large research public institution belongs? Or do we let that kind of go and say, okay, there's another portion of the domain that's going to address that? I almost would look at what the population is that you currently are serving, Larry and decide if that's the type of experience that, that they need. I mean, what is, what is the demo, demographic need of your population versus is that necessary a model? That's why I said there's so many factors you need to take into account when you're deciding what direction are you going to go in, where are you going to, what are you going to emphasize. Um, and I'm sure you have tons of data that says this is, you know, your typical student, this is what they need, this is what they, what they want to do. So not to not keep your eye out for those trends and not to know that there are potential disruptors out there, but are they the right ones that this type of institution needs? And I don't think it's just based on R1. I think it's based on where you're located who you, and who you attract and all of that. So I think it's much more complex. It, it may be a demand, though, uh, for yep. the students coming into our population. They want these varied kind of experiences and and uh, they want a single institution? I, I don't know. Maybe not. Maybe they want multiple institutions to well, provide. Well, that's a, such a good point because a lot of, uh, that's what I, you know, that's a lot of the research that's starting to get done now is, again, in the future, will that be the new student, right? Will they come to Penn State for something, but then will go off and do a different experience someplace else? Um, so I don't think that's out of the question either. Yeah. Renee? That triggered something. Are you seeing anything um, at any institutions where they're doing a good job of those kinds of students? They start for one purpose, they might go on to something else and come back. Usually they're kind of lost in the system in our kind of model. So how are institutions addressing it? I think it's still in its infancy, and I, and I go back to the learning analytics and how institutions are lear using learning analytics. Are you, they using them to catch them before they go? The grant that we we received with the, the digital courseware grant from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation was very specifically focused on those types of students, more focused on first generation um, minority students, but how are they getting lost and are there ways that digital courseware can help them? So are we seeing people doing things? We're seeing pockets. Is anyone doing it really well yet? I haven't seen anybody that's doing it really well, but they certainly are looking at ways that they can do that. Uh, there are some lessons to be learned already from uh, students who are attending institutions uh, physically, uh, particularly community colleges, because the pattern in community colleges yeah. is it'll take approximately 10 to 15 years, and a person will attend six, seven different institutions or locations, and there'll be significant gaps in time between each of those events. And so I would imagine that, yeah. th that that pattern is probably mm -hmm. going to map well yeah. To, to this environment yeah. as, in, in, as well. No, I think you're right. I think you're absolutely right. I think Chris had a question right up for me there. Um, yeah, so that, that was very yeah. similar to what uh, Rick was saying, is that uh, the influence of uh, online education changing, uh, changing learning from this like discrete chunks of your life. Right. I'm, I get up and move to this town, and I live there for four or five years, and that's just what I do. Whereas it's sort of just part of your experience, not only All the way in, in the undergrad and graduate, but also engagements in professional development. Right, and I think that's the big thing that we've had to follow, particularly for me in, in my generation. I mean, it was I was very fortunate because in, in 
with my parents, I was always going to college, but it was it was definitely a, a linear event. High school, college, graduate school, if you, if you chose, and there was no gaps in between. There was no opportunity to divert. And was that the best experience for me? I didn't know what the heck I wanted to do when I went into college. You know, I put down I wanted to be a child development major. I ended up being a mass communication major. But I, I just put down something because I had to get into college because that was the drill. Um, so I think this whole notion of students being individual and being able to focus on them and everyone takes a different path is, is really important. It's, and it's exciting to imagine that we can actually do that, you know? And the word you just used down at NSF, they're trying to abandon the phrase pipeline. We always hear about the pipeline, right? And they're saying, no, there's not a pipeline anymore. There's pathways. Yeah, and yeah. That's, that's your yeah. point. True, right behind you there, Rick, would you? Perfect. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> um, a, a couple of more skeptical thoughts. No, well, we right. love you. <laughs> Seriously, Drew. <laughs> Seriously. Drew the skeptic in the um, back. So, so the longer I've been in, in the integration of technology, new learning models, I mean, we, we've, in, in the past 20 years, that we've made a lot of progress understanding how the brain actually learns. Yeah. And while my brain learns um, in, 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 in its own neurology, I mean, that's an individual thing. But what we know more about learning is that it happens in a social setting, mm -hmm. and that the environments in which we learn are very important um, predictors of what kinds of learning will take place, which goes back to Renata's point, which is that students are really, they really desire these, these salient relationships with other students, with the institution, with their instructors. And the more we, we lead them into these individualized paths away from those relationships, and giving them the opportunities for those relationships to form, the more we're sort of pulling apart the way the brain actually learns no, and, I think you're and making, how outcomes form. And then the other yeah, part of that is, is um, this goes all the way back to the 19th century with the elective curriculum at Harvard. Um, what we know about students, and I think human beings in general, is that we're fundamentally irrational animals. <laughs> we don't make rational decisions, even if we believe we are. We don't know what we want, and we don't know what makes us happy. Um, unless we have a social environment to help form what happiness, what pleasure, what all these things are, it might put us into the right career path to help us understand what our strengths are, mm -hmm. what our weaknesses are. Because I, like you, I, I came into college as a psych major with this idea, I'm going to help people. And then I took calculus. <laughs> like, why am I here? Because <laughs> I didn't know what psychology was. I had no clue what psychology actually was. Um, I was in the wrong major, so I picked a different major, and now I'm in a career that has nothing to do with my major there. So we do have these pathways, but I made a lot of bad choices along the way, and I needed people there to help me change my course and change my path. So the relationship was so important. I think, you know, and I, this would be such a great philosophical discussion because I resonate with a lot of things that you say. I also go back to this is not a solitary journey in the, collabor the collaborative pay places. And I think you all are doing this here. That's why having these collaborative workspaces where individuals or students can engage. So we're not totally cut off by, by technology. Um, and also your whole point about how we function, how our brain functions too. I think, again, as we make the choices that we, we do with regards to what types of technology we're going to use and how much of a role we're going to let technology play in the classroom, that's something that's really important to consider as well. I'm really struck by a lot of the stuff that you were saying about um, the uncollege kind of experience to help people find their way. I've been really, really riveted by, um, and you've probably heard of it, the Wayfinding Academy yeah. in Portland, where they reverse everything because they, they, you know, they say you pick a major, you go to college, you pick something, then you try it out. They have a two-year associate degree, which is based on trying it out first, narrowing down, and when you're done with your two-year degree, yeah. you actually know what you want to major in. So, I, what I wonder often is how do we do that? in an institution that's built to go the other way. So that kind of gets to your question too, Larry. That was, that's, yeah, that's great. That, that need for flexibility. Right. And yeah, we're, we're not overly flexible right. at times because of scale and, and those. Um, Drew, and I, I just real quick, I really, uh, you, you struck me with your comment about the challenge between personalized, individualized instruction, mm -hmm. right? Uh, your example uh, about, uh, you know, let's go out and learn um, 
arcs and such at the racetrack. I have no interest in a racetrack. I, I, I just have, but if you want to talk to me about fishing now, <laughs> oh, yeah. now well, I raise that because I say yeah. you can teach me about that. But now Drew and I have different contexts that yeah. we've learned. Is, is that, that that's challenging? That's challenging. So I was going to go back to Stevie's comment here about the um, about the how do you turn this in an institution like this? I think you know from my standpoint, because th you shared that paper with me, so I've been yeah. thinking a lot about it. Um, so I think one of the things we do is we may not be able to flip the whole thing, but if we think about what it is that our students really struggle with, and you know, it's usually not flipping the entire thing. Um, they usually, like, like Drew, are thinking psychology is it. For whatever reason you think psychology is the thing you want to do when you first come in. We have a lot of students that think this is the thing they want to do, yeah. but it's, it's not really the major. It's generally what they know is something about where they want to be. They want to work in the aerospace industry, so they think the only way to get to do that is be an aerospace engineer or the health field, and they think the only way to do that is this. Mm -hmm. But I think we can do some of this if we start off where, where what spaces in, this, in per, the profession, in society, do you want to be? And then you can actually show them all the different things that could be there, right? But I think we start with what major do you want? I mean, can you imagine this is the question we start people with? You know, again, no. so we don't, we don't need to flip it upside down, but we, we do have other ways of getting at this, I think. And we just have to be, that's where I think we have to be more creative rather than trying to upheave our whole system. Make it happen. You help me. You help me. You help me. Thanks, Renata. Uh, Jan, question, comment? I think it times out. Okay. <laughs> this question takes the conversation in a slightly different direction, but it really does tie in. Um, would you talk, do you have any thoughts about how the cost of education will influence the future of education. You know, there's different scenarios. I mean, you know, again, I kind of alluded at the end that it's going to be broken apart into, into chunks. So it might not be the degrees that we, we see, but it, it'll be the a la carte, you know, like what you do on an airplane now. You know, you buy your food, you buy, you know, you pay for your baggage or, or whatever. That, that's, that's the ex extreme view. I don't know if that's necessarily the right view. I know there's different there's different models out there that people are trying to get their hand on. Huge, and I know you guys are working on it here, huge open source initiatives, which I think are going to help a lot. Uh, we were just out in California um, with with the California state system and did a, a, a one-day event with them out there. They're doing a lot with open source. I think that's going to help with, with the model. But I, I don't think we have the answer yet. I, it's still too early to tell what's going to happen with the government. You know, what kind of funding is going to still be there, you know? I mean, I, I heard on, I didn't hear the whole thing today about Pell Grants, what might be impacted with Pell Grants. I mean, we just, we just don't know. Thank you. Amanda? If I can just add, um, I think in terms of cost and as someone with a significant amount of student loans, while we have some programs that are great public service loan forgiveness, which I love and can't wait till my payments are done. <laughs> um, but I think we also need to look at other things that we've talked about but just haven't implemented. I mean, in the last year, we're finally using our tax returns to file our FAFSA forms, which is crazy that we've had online education for 20 years, but we can't use our FAFSA, you know, with our tax return. The other thing that I will say, and we tried through a Gates Foundation grant <clears throat> seven years ago when I started at World Campus, is jointly administering federal financial aid. It's a simple concept. So sometimes we go to the high-tech crazy, um, jointly administering financial aid. Um, to me, and this is my personal belief, if you're going to accept federal financial aid at your institution, you should be forced to have to do that. Because if I want to take four classes at four different institutions, why can't I do that? Well, I can do that. I just can't have all my money together for my 12 credits to be full time. Yeah. And for all of those people out there that, oh, I really want to take this. Um, I took an aviation class at Lock Haven University where I went to undergrad. That's not the same class offered here, but I really want to take that. But I took it over the summer because I knew I was going to have to pay for it anyways. So I think thinking about, you know, afford, we talk about affordability, but there's some kind of, in my mind, simple things, but our processes aren't nimble and agile enough to allow for that. 
Um, and so we have to think about ways to um, make that happen for our students, particularly those who are in our lowest um, SES status, because those are the students who don't have a smartphone, they don't have a laptop, and how can we get them here if they don't have all that? And in some respects, they're already behind unless their K-12 institution is providing laptops or something like that. Good point. I don't know. Thoughts, responses? No, I just, I'm, yeah. Agreement. I'm, yeah. I, I, well, all I want to say is I just paid off my student loan two years ago. <laughs> I feel hey, good. If you don't mind, we just have a, a couple minutes. I was, go, I was going to actually shift to you, but do you want to start? Do you want to go with the question? Um, Kathleen, I was wondering, in your, in your position, could you talk about sense making? I mean, things are moving so rapidly, and, but then you have statements like MOOCs are going to destroy higher ed, and then there's the potential impact of, of the disruption of competency-based education and the impact of technologies like artificial intelligence and immersive reality, and et cetera. As a leader, how do you make sense out of it? Because you don't want to just chase things, um, but at the same time, you want to be mindful of what is important to focus upon. Yeah, that's a, that's a, he gave me the tough question. I knew he was going to do that. <laughs> that's right. OK, I'll just throw this hardball at you. No, that's, uh, you know, that's, just such a tough one and, and I, I really don't have an answer for that you know and I'm someone who lived through um, it, I felt it was a MOOC like environment when I was um, at the phone company when the World Wide Web came in and people were putting up all these all this money for no business case and and you were going like should I jump into that bubble or should I not and and we weren't we weren't sure um, you know and the MOOCs and then MOOCs came along and everyone's like well we've all got to do MOOCs but we really couldn't figure out how to do it, and should it be a primary strategy? Um, I think it's a challenge, and I think each university needs to individually, again, map out their strategies, the you know their the requirements of what they want to achieve. And I think you're going to be taking a risk, Craig. I think it's it goes back to a culture of failure. You're gonna you're gonna make some choices that are not going to be the right choices, but there's there's no guarantee anymore. I think you have to do it. I think you do. Thank you. Um, speaking of uh, risks, and I, I, I do want to ask uh, Craig to chime in on this as well. I've shared a little bit with Kathleen over the last day or so about this new initiative of uh, Dr. Barron's, the uh, Invent Penn State, and us creating uh, a vertical that uh, Craig and I, a few others, are responsible for the EdTech network. And I'm wondering if you are seeing similar kinds of initiatives at other institutions, if you could comment. And I'd also ask to like have Craig also just reflect a little bit about what you see the EdTech network meaning to Penn State, the opportunity. Can we start with you? Yeah, sure. Uh, we are seeing pockets of, of colleges and universities exper experimenting around um, with EdTech. University of Pennsylvania just is doing their competition. Um, we're also seeing companies like Pearson, who's getting into EdTech as well. They've got a whole innovation lab. So again, I think universities are looking outside, you know, their their sphere to see. Um, I, I can talk about us personally. Um, we're looking at a ways that we can um, en enlarge our community by introducing more types of ed tech um, partners into our membership. Again, to help inform our membership because we're getting asked those types of questions, the same type of question that Craig just asked. Where should we go? What should we be doing? So I think people, it's on everybody's radar. So again, but not not a huge groundswell, but but it is definitely out there. Yeah. Would you mind reflecting a little bit about where you see the EdTech network going at Penn State? Well, I'm Dr. Barron has a vision within Ben Penn State that Penn State is a economic driver for the region. Um, there's, I think, something like 70% of employees now in this region are either um, working at the university or government or the school system. And so there's very little diversity relative to um, our economy, but also for opportunities for talented spouses or student interns, et cetera. And so he's looking at sectors that Penn State may pursue. And many of their traditional areas are areas like material sciences where we've got great research. But he started looking at what we're doing across the university relative to innovations with faculty learning designers and staff around educational technology and looked, is there an opportunity for us to leverage our expertise to begin to look at startups in this area as well as looking at partnerships with various companies that we're working with. So we're in the process now of uh, working this area uh, very aggressively and have some promise with um, a 
couple companies in artificial intelligence right now. So exciting thing. So when you come back next year, yeah. uh, we'll be able to give you an update on this, on this initiative. But it's an exciting time. Again, I, I think it's a dramatic time for the universities to be adjusting and shifting and accommodating to these different kind of forces. But it's, it's the uh, book that Ray Schroeder and others wrote yeah. recently called Change We Must. And we all feel that pressure, and I'm, I'm guessing you're seeing that as well. Yeah, I am. I, and I was, I was telling Larry and, and Craig at lunch I, when I was here a few weeks ago for your, for your symposium, which was amazing. I, I had to leave early just because you can't get home from here, Larry. We do have that <laughs> issue. <laughs> um, and as, as I was leaving, I see this robotic thing come rolling up to me, and it was Beam. Um, and for me, that was like I was saying, it was like meeting a rock star because I've been reading so much about that technology and, and, and the capability that it has for students that cannot attend class. And it's for those of you that haven't seen it, it it's just it's just amazing. And again, blown away by some of the things that you all are doing here. That was that was that was that was huge for me. It made my day. <laughs> <laughs> well, listen. Uh, with that, we're gonna we're gonna draw it to a close. Thank you again, Kathleen, for joining us. Thank you for having me. And um, just a, a comment again, Kathleen, we'll be back one more, well, we know this year, this summer, Kathleen will be back with us for the ninth uh, Institute for Emerging Leadership and Online Learning uh, in August. And so, we, again, Kathleen, we so much appreciate the relationship with you and the Organization of Online Learning Consortium. And thank you for joining us today.